Hey, my name is Jesse. Welcome to The Weekly for the week of June 11th. Today we're talking about finding your people. So when I was 19 years old, I became a Christian. And it was the first time in my life that I started to get straight A's in school. In kindergarten, I got C's. In senior English, Miss Flicker's class, I'll never forget, I was flunking that class and barely graduated high school. Uh, But I became a Christian and I started to get straight A's all through community college. And I was so excited, especially when I first started to get those A's that I wanted to call my dad every single time and just tell him how pumped I was that I got another A. You see, my dad was one of my people. Peter and John, they were just released from prison and then we see that they immediately go to their people. God has wired us to have our people. We are not meant to live alone, but not just any kinds of people. We see that Peter and John have a certain kind of people, and there's four qualities that we will see that these people had. Uh, Number one, they declare who God is, uh, that God is the creator. And so we see that in the text, that they say that God has created all things and is the beginning from the end. He is the creator. We see that God is the revealer. He has revealed himself through the Holy Spirit, Uh, and then finally that God is sovereign through all of history, and they're declaring this uh, in the text. Now there's two ways to know God. The first way is that we as humans try and say, this is who God is. We're going to uh, make it up based on our experience or our circumstances or our feelings or observing things. Now, uh, trying to define and understand uh, the all-powerful creator of the heavens and earth to me seems fairly silly, but people do it all the time. They say, this is who God is to me. That's one way to try and understand God. The second way to try and understand God is by God revealing who he is to humanity. It's by God saying, you cannot understand me. I'm too big and too uh, too magnificent for you to understand. So if you want to know me, let me tell you who I am. And that has been captured in the Bible. Uh, I believe that all Christians Uh, should be theologians. Um, And don't be scared by that word. Uh, Theology is just simply the study of God. Theos is God and ology is the study of, just like anthropology is, uh, anthro means man and ology is the study of the study of man. And um, I don't mean that we are to be theologians that go to seminary and live in the library and read all of these thick, dense books, but that all Christians should be um, in community learning and studying who God is together in community. And so the first thing is that you need to find your people who you are learning to be a theological thinker with. You need to find your people to be a theological thinker with. And again, this is best done in community with other people. That's what we see is happening in the text. And one reason why this is helpful is Um, often we don't have enough faith on our own. And so when we're with other people who have walked with God and know God, we can, what I talk about is borrowing their faith. We can, uh, we don't have enough faith on our own. We don't have enough wisdom about who God is. And so we can borrow and learn together in community to become theological thinkers. Well, based on right thinking, we see that the The people, uh, Peter and John's people, they make three prayer requests. So that's the next part of the text. They say, uh, number one, God, consider their threats. So the people, uh, the religious leaders are saying, don't speak in the name of Jesus anymore or we're going to arrest you and flog you. And so they're threatening them. So they say, consider their threats, not to stop them because evil and sin is going to happen, but just God, um, help be with us through this difficult season. Uh, The second thing they say is, enable us to speak boldly the name of Jesus. And so they double down. Uh, The religious leaders say, don't speak in the name of Jesus. And they say, God, give us boldness to speak in the name of Jesus. And then the third thing in the prayer request is they say, God, stretch out your hand to heal. Don't stretch out your hand to destroy those people or for um, those kind of things. Stretch out your hand, God, so that healing may happen through us among the people around us. And so the second thing is that you need to find your people who pray for boldness to share Jesus. Now, 
boldness does not mean yelling at each other. Uh, it doesn't mean being um, disrespectful. Um, boldness means that you have fallen in love with Jesus through the stories of the gospel in particular, and that you share who Jesus is and I want to call it specifically in the stories of Jesus in his interactions with the poor widow, the bleeding woman, the woman at the well, the man with the withered hand, the centurion, Peter, uh, the, poor, the rich ruler. Um, there's so many moments in the life of Jesus that we need to get to know the real Jesus based on what the four gospels tell us who Jesus is and not from this abstract idea of who we think Jesus is. And so we pray for boldness and we want to be around people who are boldly proclaiming the actual stories of Jesus um, through our own love for Jesus in them. Um, and so the next thing we see is that they are all filled. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And I used in the sermon the illustration of the snow globe. Um, the snow globe represents us, uh, the ball in the water, um, and that the spreckles, the little pieces inside of the, in the water, inside the snow globe is like the Holy Spirit. That at, that when you become baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's when you believe in Jesus and become, uh, saved. And that's when the little spreckles come into your snow globe. That's the Holy Spirit. You've been, um, born again into the family of God, that you've been regenerated by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you've been your soul has been made alive to God for eternity. And before that moment, you were not. That happens one time. That happens at the moment when you are saved. And really, God and you are the only ones that really know that. But that's when the pieces go into the snow globe. That happens once. Um, but from that point on, that we are that we see that in the life of the early church in Acts that the people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that happens on a regular basis that the Spirit is animating their life and they, um, and it happens at particular moments and we should be praying on a regular basis, God, today fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit. And the image of the snow globe is God, shake me up. That's, your Spirit has is in me, but it's settled to the bottom. And God, I need you to, to shake me up and allow your Holy Spirit to animate and fill every part of my life in this particular moment, every single day we can um, be that. So find your people who are living um, in the fullness of the Spirit or animated by the Spirit. That's the third thing is find those people. So these kinds of people, what we see is they create this beautiful community of sacrificial generosity. This is the kind of people and community that I do believe that we all want to be a part of, but we're not really good at it. Um, we see that they are using their possessions, um, not claiming them as their own, and they're, they're selling property and, and using it for the needs of the people uh, in their community. And so the fourth thing is that we need to find people um, to practice generosity with. And I, I would call you, don't look for ways to other people to be generous to you, but call you to be generous to the people around you. Uh, in the early church, they're not pressured or forced to do this. It just comes naturally based on their um, previous theological thinking that God is creator. And, and everything that they have is a gift from him, that, that they didn't earn it. That essentially, if we're honest, all things are a gift from God that he wants us to use generously uh, among the people. And so um, in house church, how can you practice generosity with those around you. For many of us, it's uh, bringing a meal and, and offering it to those around us. Uh, we just had a baby shower at our house, and we actually had two baby showers on the same uh, house church because there's two moms that are, ha that are their, birth their delivery dates were two days or one day from each other. And so we were generous to provide those parties for them or help each other move or serve together. I want to offer to you, house churches, how can you um, individually think about ways to be generous with each other. And so I want you to discuss in your house church how you can become these kinds of people just like the early church.